It doesn't matter how right you think you are. If you're hurting the business, if you're costing the business money, then you need to recognize that you are wrong and you will not be a successful CISO. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome to this week's episode of Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole, where each week we take you on a journey of tips and tricks and things you need to know to be as effective as possible as a Chief Information Security Officer. So whether you're currently a Chief Information Security Officer or you want to be one in the future, this show will have information and details that will allow you to go to that next level. I always like to start off each show with a little piece of advice I get from my coaching and talking with people. And probably the big one that I wanna emphasize is security is a business enabler. You need to go in and view security as helping the business. Security is not here to stop people from doing things. It's not here to make their job more difficult or harder. It's to allow them to go to the next level. And I'll tell you, there's still a lot of what I call old school security folks where they think their job is to stop people from doing things, to say no, to find fault, to find issues, to find problems. And I will tell you, those types of folks will not be successful as security leaders. And the reason is simple. One of my golden rules of doing security for over 30 years is if security negatively impacts the business, security is wrong. It doesn't matter how right you think you are, if you're hurting the business, if you're costing the business money, then you need to recognize that you are wrong and you will not be a successful CISO. So always think business enabler. I will tell you, I learned this lesson back in the 90s when I got hired at a telecom and security wasn't the most popular folks out there because previous security people and engineers, they would always go in and tell people, no, you can't do this. There's too many vulnerabilities. There's too many exposures. This is at risk, that's at risk. And we have to remember, there's always risks. The reason why security folks are being paid the big bucks is not to say no. I can hire anybody to sit in a meeting and say no. It's the creative mindset. It's the creative mindset of a CISO to come up with solutions to even the most complex problems. So when I took over, I sat down with my staff and I told them two rules. One, if anybody comes to you with a new project or a new idea, you don't shoot it down. You don't say you can't do it. You don't say it's too big a risk. You say, excellent, let's look at what you're trying to do and let's come up with a solution that has the functionality you need and has the appropriate level of security for the organization that we're trying to implement it at. And that was the first rule. The second rule, because these were really smart folks, many of them came from engineering and program management backgrounds. I said, if you get put on a project, even though you work for security and your job is to minimize risk and make sure that the system has an acceptable level of risk based on the environment it's deployed in and the data that's supporting, I want you to do anything possible to make the project successful. Anything that's required. If you need to stay late to help them configure routers or switches, if they you need to stay late or come in early to write documentation, I want you to do anything possible because I wanna get the reputation that when security is involved with projects, they are successful and come across the finish line. And it's interesting because four years later, I'm sitting at my desk and I get a call from the CEO. And he goes, Eric, I'd like to see you. It's like, great. At first, I was a little nervous, but then I said, wait a second. If I did something wrong, I was canned. I don't think the CEO would call me up. So he says, Eric, I just want to ask you a question. We recently had a meeting and I said, I want to know all the projects that have been delivered 
under schedule and under budget. So essentially on time and for what it was originally bid for. And I want to find out what was the commonality of all those projects. And he said, honestly, it surprised me. Only 37% of the projects in our company were actually delivered on time and under budget. All the others went over budget and over schedule. And the only commonality that we can find of those 37% of those projects that were successful was that security was actively involved. All of the other projects that went over budget and over schedule, security wasn't involved with those projects. And they sort of smiled and said, what's your secret? And I told them, I said, first, business, security is a business enabler. When I work in security, the job is to make the business successful. We never want to hurt the business. We want to help the business. I said, second, I know that when I took over, security was negatively viewed in the organization and was often viewed as a roadblock. I wanted to change that. So I told my staff, when I put you on a project, even though your primary focus is security, you do anything possible to make the project successful. And I would urge that if you want to be a CISO or you're currently a CISO, to adapt those two rules with your team. Be a business enabler. Start with yes and look at how to do it with an appropriate level of security and managing risk. And two, do anything possible to make the projects successful. And I find if more CISOs viewed security as a business enabler and did anything possible to help the company succeed, security would be viewed a lot different in a lot of organizations. Now don't get me wrong, I know some of you that watch this, I respect you, you're an amazing CISO, you already know these lessons, so I'm not saying all CISOs do this, but I'm saying a lot of folks still have that mentality that we have to have 100% security and we can't allow any risk in the organization. And the bottom line is, if you're going to have functionality, there's going to be risk. There's always gonna be some risk and some exposure. So we want to manage it to an acceptable level, not try to stop all risk, because stopping all risk means we're stopping all business. So what I'd like to do on this episode is sort of look at what are the skills that CISOs need, and I want to do a little different, because I talked to a lot of folks, and I did a lot of research, and I read a lot of articles on the top 10 skills for CISOs and the top things that CISOs must have to be successful. And I'll be honest with you, half of them I agreed with and half of them are things that I do not believe a CISO should do. One of the problems with CISOs is they try to do too much. And if you try to do too much or be the hero, you end up not doing anything well and falling short on what you're trying to accomplish. The second problem I see with CISOs, and if you've listened to any of my previous episodes, you know this is sort of one of my themes, is they get too technical. If you're a chief information security officer, you are the security strategist. You need to think at a high level and plan the strategy, and you have people that work for you that do the tactical implementation. So I'm going to give you a top 10 list, but it's a little different. The first six are skills that all successful CISOs that I've met have. And the last four are skills or areas that successful CISOs don't have or don't focus on. So I'm going to present the list a little differently on the do's and don'ts to be a successful CISO. So the first thing a successful CISO must have, in my opinion, is communication and presentation skills. You must be able to effectively communicate. And what I mean by that is understanding your audience and being able to adapt effectively. I often hear people say after I speak, they go, are you multiple people? Because I was at a recent event where I had to give three different presentations. One was to end users, one was to security engineers, and one was to executives. And I had somebody who sat in all three presentations and goes, Eric, you were a different person in all three. And I said, because I had to adapt my communication style. If I built a presentation 
and I tried to give it for all three different audiences, it wouldn't have resonated with any of them. When you're talking with users, the way you communicate to them is you need to make it personal. You need to go in and show how this is gonna help protect them, their family, and their personal finances, because that's what end users ultimately care about. So when I'm talking to end users, I'm gonna make it very, very personal to show them how to make their family and themselves safe online. When I talk with technical security engineers, they care about how can they do their job more effectively? How can they be more efficient in their skills? What are tips and tricks that allow them to catch the adversary, control the damage and minimize impact to the organization? So I'm gonna give a completely different presentation to them. And then when I talk to executives, they all wanna understand at a high level, what are the key strategic questions they need to ask to minimize massive breaches to their organization? What are the high level things they need to be aware of so they don't get that phone call at 10 p.m. saying they had a major, major breach and nobody in the organization was aware that it happened. So being able to communicate in a way that people will listen and understand and hear what you're saying is probably one of the most important skills of a CISO. You must be able to effectively communicate to those you're speaking to. Also, when we're going in and talking about communication, you need to be able to listen more than you speak. I know a lot of people, a lot of really, really smart people wanna tell everybody how smart they are. They wanna go in and they wanna dominate the meeting. They wanna go in and speak first. And they think that whoever speaks the most wins a prize and it's often the opposite. A good CISO needs to make every word count. You need to listen to everyone else, ask questions, gather all the data and information, and then effectively give recommendations. One of the things I often hear from executives is when they talk with the security folks, they don't understand the problem. I just had a CFO go, Eric, we have this brilliant, brilliant security engineer that we wanna potentially make the security officer, but whenever I talk to him, he doesn't understand the questions I'm asking. He's answering different questions and he's not giving me the information that I need. You need to listen more than you speak and follow one of my rules. I always ask three clarifying questions before you give an answer. And the other one that goes with that is not just good communication skills, but also good presentation skills. I know a lot of people have been trained up by different organizations. Once again, nobody get mad at me, but probably government contractors are the worst. I went in and sat in on their presentation classes and they actually gave a class where on a slide, you're supposed to have text across the top and then image and then text here and text here. And, and I mean, these slides are a book. I mean, one slide you could talk about for 20 minutes and they have 30 of these slides in a 15 minute presentation. And I'm just like, I don't know who you talk to that said that's good, but it don't work. Right? People are so busy reading the slides, missing the slides, trying to take notes. They're not hearing what you're saying. Your slides should be visual and they should get the message across with minimal presentations on your side. To me, when I give presentations to executives, it's usually two or three slides. And I'm there to augment the slides, not to add to it. Technically, if you looked at those slides, they have simple numbers, phrases, or metrics that get the message across. You wanna make sure you know how to present to your audience. And one of the best things I could recommend is I call it the cell phone test. And the cell phone test is this. If you're going in and giving a presentation and you get to a slide or a bullet or a talking point. And within 10 seconds, more than three people, or if it's a smaller room, 
of the people in the room pick up their cell phone. Stop. At that point, you need to either say something personal, say something interesting, a joke appropriate, but you need to break what you were doing, skip whatever you were presenting and move on to the next piece of material because you lost the audience. And I'm always doing this. When I'm presenting to small or large audiences, I'm always scanning the room, I'm watching and seeing, and if all of a sudden I get to a certain topic or certain area and I see everybody picking up their cell phones, I immediately know we got a problem. I immediately know that I need to stop whatever it is I'm presenting and move on to something else. And I have folks that go, Eric, I sat in your presentation a few times and how come last week you spent five minutes on this slide and today you didn't even cover it? I said, because the audience didn't want to hear it. They, they responded by picking up their phone. So you need to be able to read an audience and present what people want. And one other thing with communication and presentation, a bonus item here, is a really good CISO needs to know how to run a meeting. When you're running a meeting, you should have an agenda that you put together ahead of time that everybody agrees to, and you have outcomes for that meeting. Once the outcome is achieved or the outcomes achieved, you move on. You move on to the next topic. That's how you run a meeting. And if all the outcomes are achieved, you end the meeting. I so often will go into meetings and I'll sometimes ask a simple question. What's the goal of this meeting? Or what's the objective? Or what's the agenda? It's like, well, to discuss so-and-so. And after 45 minutes, I'm like, we're not getting anywhere. And then an hour ends and everyone's like, oh, next meeting. And I'm like, nothing was accomplished, right? People waste so much time in ineffective meetings. To me, that's probably one of the best things of the epidemic is because you're doing virtual online meetings, people are okay with 10 or 15 minute meetings. When somebody has to drive or fly to a meeting, they feel like it's an obligation that the meeting must run for at least two hours. And I had somebody tell me once, he goes, Eric, you flew here five hours from East Coast to West Coast. And even though we covered everything in 20 minutes, I felt like that was disrespectful. I needed to go for two hours. I said, you know something? If we accomplished everything that I got on that plane for, I have no issue making a five hour flight for a 20 minute meeting. But people have a mental issue with that. Psychologically, it doesn't make sense. So now with Zoom, it's great. You can have 10, 15, 20 minute meetings and because nobody's traveling, it's much more effective. So you definitely wanna make sure you work on your communication, presentation, and meeting skills. The second critical item a CISO must have is what I call thinking out of the box or being creative but what some folks might refer to as political skills. Let's face it, when you get into the executive ranks at a company and you're going in and you're dealing with other executives, you need to be political. You need to know how to play the game. You need to know who are your allies and who are your enemies, and you need to go in and have clear objectives on what's happening. Because I can guarantee if you have a chief level position, there are going to be people that want your job. There's going to be people that don't like you. And there's going to be people that don't want you to be successful. So you need to know how to play the game. You need to know what to say, when to say it. You need to learn from mistakes. And you need to make sure that you're very, very creative and always think out of the box. Because the problem with security as let's face it, it's not black and white. It's not that clear. It's shades of gray, and you have to be very, very creative to come up with effective solutions. One of the things that I'm notorious for that shows the creativity when we come into clients is I'll look at what they're currently doing and what they're currently spending. And today we have a lot of our clients that are spending significant amount of money on managed 
security providers or services or things that are not being very effective in terms of helping to make the organization secure. So if I go in and we just had a client that I went into and they were spending $60,000 a month on a service that was totally and completely ineffective. So I went in and said, listen, if you give me that 60K, I will revamp your entire security program. I will go in and give you metrics and I will make you more secure and you don't have to spend a penny more. And what I did was I stopped the ineffective contracts, got rid of the tools that weren't being used and I reused that 60K in a much smarter manner. So this idea that you must have big budgets and you must get all this money is a fallacy. And that's probably a bonus skill of a good CISO is learn how to be very effective with budgets. You don't need a big budget to be an effective CISO. You just have to be smart and creative on how you use those resources. And that takes us to the third critical skill of a CISO. You must understand the business and have an understanding of finances. Now, I'm not saying you need to be a chief financial officer. I'm not saying you need to be able to create balance sheets. I minored in business, but I'll tell you, and I know whatever you add to the left side, the right side, remember some of that basic stuff. But if you had me go in and wanna create balance sheets and profit and loss statements and things like that, I couldn't do it. But I'll tell you, every client I work for, I know their business, I know their profit, I know their revenue, and I know what products or business units make the most money for those clients. Because if you don't understand the business, you don't understand the finances, and you don't understand where the company is making money, how can you go in and determine an effective security budget? Is a million dollars an effective budget? Well, I know with some businesses, if I went in and I said, I wanna spend a million dollars on security, they would laugh me out the door because their entire profit for the year is 700K. If they're making 700K profit and you wanna spend a million, not only are you using up all their profit, but you're putting them negative 300K, right? That's crazy. If you don't understand the business and the finances, you won't know how much to spend. On the other hand, when I was chief scientist at Lockheed Martin, if I went to Bob Stevens, the CEO at the time, and I said, I only want a million dollars to spend on security, I also would have been laughed out of the room because at a company that's multi-billion dollar, they spend 30 to $40 million on security. So you must understand the business and understand the finances to make sound recommendations. The fourth one is strategic planning. You need to go in and put together an effective plan that can withstand all of the different things that happen from a cyber security standpoint. One thing I see is many CISOs are very reactionary. As soon as something happens, oh, we need a new AI tech. And then as soon as something happens, we need this, we need this, we need this. And they don't have a yearly strategic plan with a clear budget, or if they did, they completely blow it away because every month they want something new. Every month there's a new shiny object. Every month there's a new problem, there's a new issue. Putting together a robust, effective cybersecurity strategy is not easy. It takes a lot of time, it takes forward thinking, and it takes some creativity. But if you do it correctly, your strategic plan should be able to last for at least 12 months. It should be able to withstand all of the crazy changes in attacks, threats, and the security industry because you thought out all the different risks to your organization. At the end of the day, cybersecurity is all about understanding, managing, and mitigating risk to your critical assets. So if you understand what your critical assets are, where they're located and what the key business processes are, you should be able to create a strategic plan that is sound and can withstand the test of time and be good for at least 12 months in your organization. 
Five, the fifth one, be willing to ask for help. You don't need to be Superman or Superwoman. You don't need to be the Lawn Ranger. You don't have to do it yourself. So many CISOs want to be that hero. They want to be that person that solves world hunger and they won't ask for help. Once again, back to number two, have political skills. You won't survive. You must have a team around you. You must have support from other executives and you must be able to ask for help when and where needed. A successful CISO has a very, very close relationship with legal. They have a very close relationship with finance and they have a very close relationship with IT. And they meet with those folks on a regular basis and they're not afraid to ask for help or ask for support. You can't do it alone. Another way I could go in and say item five is a really good CISO knows their swim lane and tries to stay in their swim lane. I was coaching a new CISO and this person was really, really smart. The problem is they were doing so many other factors. They lost their IT director. So this CISO now wanted to take on all the IT problems. They lost their director of programming. So this person wanted to take on all that. And they were so busy trying to build the kingdom and solve all the world's problem that they totally missed focusing on security and ended up losing their job. Know your swim lane. Know who you need to partner with to solve problems, but know your swim lane and really good CISOs stay within their swim lane. Six, really good CISOs have risk-based thinking. It's all about understanding and knowing risk. One of the best pieces of advice I could give to CISOs is let data drive decisions, not emotions. One of the worst things a CISO can do is forget that security is about managing risk and stop looking at the data and get emotional. As soon as you get emotional, the wheels come off the car. Things start going bad very, very quickly. When I go in and present to executives, I'm always showing them the data. It's real simple. Here's the top risk. Here's the likelihood of it occurring, cost of it occurs, and cost to fix it. That's data. That's risk-based data-driven decisions. Now, someone in the executive team might not agree that we should fix that risk. They might think that that's an acceptable risk and that's okay because ultimately the CEO has to take risks to run a business and if the CEO wants to decide that they're willing to accept some risks over others, that's okay. That's their decision but nobody ever debates on the numbers because factual numbers are factual numbers. Now, if I went in and I didn't have the data and I said, these are the top risks because I know that there's different attack vectors and it really bothers me and I'm, I'm very concerned about this and I know, I know deep inside that these are really important things and we must do that. They could argue with me all day long. Well, we don't agree. We don't think it's important. We, and, and that's where you get yourself into trouble because emotional-based decisions have no foundation, can get argued, and when you are known for being very, very emotional, you lose faith and trust very quickly. Really good executives let data drive decisions and they don't get emotional. Really good CISOs let data drive their risk-based thinking and they focus on what is the risk, likelihood of occurring, cost if it occurs, and cost to fix it. So if you want to be the best in the world, Chief Information Security Officer, focus on six things. Communication and presentation skills, political skills or thinking out of the box and being creative, business and financial understanding, strategic planning, asking for help building a team and staying in your swim lane, and having risk-based thinking and let data drive decisions and not emotions. Now there's four things that a good CISO shouldn't do. 
These are the four things that derail really good CISOs. And once again, not everyone agrees with me because I've read a lot of articles where these four are included in a good CISO, but I completely disagree and I'll explain why. And once again, I love comments from you. So either post comments to this video or you can send me an email at ecole at secure-anchor.com and I'd love to hear from you. The four don'ts, the four things that I find get CISOs into a lot of trouble. The first one is a CISO shouldn't be focused on incident response. You should have somebody reporting to you that does that. You should have a lead incident response person that reports to you and you report to the executives. But you shouldn't be managing and running incident response teams. An incident response lead is a full-time job. You are training, you are constantly learning skills, you are working as a team. If you are a CISO and you try to also be the lead of incident response, you are spreading yourself way too thin and you are not going to be effective. Incident response reports to the CISO, but it's not the role of the CISO. Regulation and compliance. Now, yes, you should understand what the basic regulations are. If you process credit cards, you should understand the laws and regulations, but that's not your job. You're not a lawyer. I had a CISO once that said, oh, I'm taking some legal classes. I said, why? Don't you have chief legal counsel? And they said, yes. I said, use them, build a team around them, but you have enough to do worrying about cybersecurity and chief legal counsel has enough to do worrying about law. Don't try to do other people's jobs. You should have enough understanding to know when to bring in legal, when to bring in accounting and when to bring in other experts, but you're not the expert. You just have a team that's built around you. Don't try to be a one person show that's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. Third, don't. You're not a pen tester. Pen testing is tactical. Pen testing is a very advanced skill. Pen testing is a full-time job. Now, once again, if you're a CISO, you might hire pen testers. If you're a big enough organization, you might have pen testers working for you, but you're not a pen tester. That's the first indicator that a company put the wrong person in charge. If you have a CISO says, I can do the pen test, you're still in the technical world. Remember, good CISOs are strategy, not technical. And the last one is program management. Now you should understand program management. You should know what a good project looks like, but a good CISO should have a PM right next to them. That's one of the first positions I recommend a CISO hire. Even if you have a small team, a good chief information security officer should always have a program manager reporting to them, managing, tracking all of the projects and deliverables that are under cyber security. So just to summarize, the four things a CISO shouldn't be doing is running an incident response team, worrying about the details of regulation and compliance, doing pen testing, and managing all of the programs under their department. So if you go in and work on the skills you do need and work on the skills you don't need, because one of the things that CISOs often tell me is I wish I had more time. Having more time is not the issue. Using your time more wisely is. So focus on communication, political skills, business, strategic planning, knowing your swim lane and risk-based thinking. Focus all your energy on improving those skills and don't worry about incident response, regulation compliance, pen testing, and program management. And if you focus on what you need to do and not on what you shouldn't doing, you will be a very, very successful CISO. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO. I'd love to hear from you. Please drop a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you'd like an uh, episode on a different topic, or you can email me, ecole 
at secure-anchor.com. And until next week, remember, let data drive decisions, not emotions.